Thank you everyone for your patience with a few technical glitches. And I, I'm sorry that um, some of my photos in all of this didn't transfer, so there's just gonna be a few blank slides, which I'm pretty bummed about because there were some beautiful images, but we'll just move ahead. Uh, I think I swore at the last clan conference that um, that would have been my last talk on the CCC, but Ishmael Hope um, really asked me to speak on the Juno CCC polls, which I hadn't addressed in my book. Um, some of you might know that last year, after 10 years of research, with a help from a lot of people at this conference, I finally published a book on the New Deal totem parks, and I'll be talking more about that larger project tomorrow. Um, but just to give a brief overview before I dive into the Juno polls, um, the book project really looked at the work of the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, their work from 1938 to 1942 to restore more than 121 totem poles from mostly southern southeast Alaska. They were charged with um, gaining permission from various native leaders to um, remove totem poles, 19th century poles, from uh, ancestral native villages and to bring those poles for repair or replication in CCC totem workshops. This one was in Saxman. They were working on the Chief Ebbets pole. And then finally they re-erected those poles in these invented arrangements of the New Deal totem parks which are still human, uh, tremendously popular with tourists. So on this map, you can see most of the totem parks were based in southern southeast Alaska, in Cloak, Kassan, Heidelberg, Wrangell, Totem Bight, and Saxman. Uh, they also restored some poles that Governor John Brady had collected for the Sitka Totem Park in the early 20th century, so the CCC did some work there. But you can see here there were three totem poles carved for Juno under the auspices of the CCC. And I really had not studied those much in my book project. So it was a real pleasure to get to work on this paper. And um, it allows me also to acknowledge one of the major polls that we'll be talking about and that Ed Kuntz has kindly agreed to come up and talk about is the Yachte poll. And I'd like to acknowledge that I am a guest on Ach Kwan Ani. So again, I apologize, I was desperately trying to recover some images. Um, I had to get a few off the internet to um, this morning for this presentation. But these are the three poles in Juno that were carved for the C under the CCC. On the left is the governor's mansion pole, often called the governor's pole. In the middle is the four-story pole by John Wallace. And the last is the Yachte pole out at Ock Bay, which was designed by U.S. Forest Service architect Lynn Forrest and carved by Frank St. Clair, along with two assistants who have remained unnamed in CCC archives. So I'll just go through these um, quickly. I wanted to just say I have been desperately searching for letters on the Juno CCC polls. Um, I've been combing through the archives here in Juneau for some letters. Just yesterday, um, with the help of Rachel Myron, I found these beautiful gouache paintings by a mysterious E.J. Carter from the early 40s, and these were all poles that he was painting in the Sitka Park. I also found Lynn Forrest's original design for the entrance pole to the Sitka Park, but no letters. And that's going to be a continual theme in my talk today because for most of the CCC polls down in southern southeast Alaska, there's extensive correspondence in the National Archives. But for the Juno polls, there's a relative paucity of letters. And I don't know if that's because the Southern Division of the Forest Service had to hand over all of their letters at the end of the CCC period and headquarters in Juneau just did whatever they want, wanted with their letters. Those may have disappeared or they may still be here in Juneau somewhere. I would love to find out more about that. Okay, let's dive into what we do know about these polls. So I'll first, I'll start with the Governor's Mansion poll which was carved from 1939 to 1940. Um, it's the only of the CCC polls that I know of that was carved of yellow cedar, 
rather than red cedar. It's very unusual, but in some ways reflective more of this Juno area where there was no red cedar for monumental carving. It was begun here in Juneau by Charlie Tagcook, which is sometimes spelled Tagcook. Um, and I spoke with his great niece, Maxine Reichert, who said he was um, born in Yundastucky, the village near the Haines Airport, um, and was Jilkat Kwan Lukakhari. Tag Cook was already well known as a demonstration carver for Walter Waters' curio shop in Wrangell, Alaska by the time he began the governor's totem in 1939. According to his great niece, Maxine Reichert, um, he was Luka Hari clan of the Raven Moiety, and it's interesting to note that the crest stories he depicted on the governor's mansion pole drew from Raven Moiety stories that Tag Cook had a right to display. Many older carvers in the CCC were anxious about designing totem poles for the US government rather than for the opposite moiety as was tradition. Since the government did not have the right to display any clinket crests, it seems that some carvers chose to design crest poles based on crests that they themselves had the right to display. On this pole, for example, Tag Cook chose to begin with the figure of Nas Shagihiel, raven at the head of the Nas, or grandfather raven. And I did have a, a closer image of that very top raven. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have it now. This is from the famous story of raven um, tricking his grandfather on the Nas River into giving him the box of daylight and thus giving light to the world. It's my understanding that any member of the raven moiety can refer to this famous story and can display the crest of um, Nashagi Yale. The next figure on the pole is Man, which was identified in a 1941 article by US Forest Service architect Lynn Forrest as the man in the creation of man story that relates to the old woman underneath figure at the base of the pole. Forrest, who was the architect of the totem parks in southern southeast Alaska, and who worked to record many of the totem pole stories for the book The Wolf and the Raven, co-edited with Viola Garfield, apparently interviewed Tag Cook for this article and published the key to the pole in its CCC letter, the CCC newsletter. The article writes, the second figure on the totem is man. The figure is given here, the figure as given here is related to a short version of man's creation by Raven. It is told in conjunction with the bottom figure of He Yi Shanuk, or woman underneath, who had held up the world and also controlled the tides. The world is shown above her head. And I was trying to, here you can see this is at the base of the pole. There's Raven above world. I'm not sure that I've, I was using um, the phonetic pronunciation. So please, for, it's close. Can you say it, Ishmael? Ha'yi shanak. Ha'yi shanak. And Emma Marks uh, told this story, and that was Nora, Nora's uh, uh, daughter. And it was published by Richard and Nora in a, a scholarly article. So you have a really good clinket version of this story. Something like JSTOR. Awesome. Yeah. The old woman underneath, Hai Yi Sha Nak. Thank you, Gosh Cheesh. Um, oh, so I'll go here. Continuing, so th this was the story that Lynn Forrest recorded. Continuing his search for food, Raven finally went to old woman underneath, who held up the world on the foreleg of a beaver. He asked her to lower the waters of the ocean so that he might get some sea urchins to eat, but she refused and just sat by her fire and attended a large pot which is upon it. Incidentally, when those about her displeased her or spoke cross words, the cover of the pot shook and the earth trembled as a consequence. To quiet this, people in their community threw ulican oil or other grease on the fire which went to her and all would become normal again. So Raven departed and went back to shore. This time he espied a small each sea urchin floating on a piece of kelp. So he gathered it and returned to old woman underneath. He refused to tell her how he obtained it, but demanded that she lower the tide 
or he would turn her over and rub the sea urchin on her buttocks. When she continued to refuse, he did rub the sea urchin on her buttocks. And then when Raven went out again, the water had lowered sufficiently that he might gather sea urchins for food. So he returned a final time to old woman underneath and instructed her to have the tides rise and fall twice every day, which of course she has done ever since. Emily. Yes. Uh, Fred White yeah. at Gold Belt Heritage. Little cheesh. Returning to the two crests in the middle of the pole, mosquito and the cannibal spirit, and again, I'm not sure I've spelled this correctly, gutil. These crests were more strongly associated with the Ganahudi frog house of Klukwan, at least in terms of the famous house posts that featured the cannibal spirit gutil. I thought I had an image here. The story that Lynn Forrest recorded for these two images, these two crests, goes as follows. Years ago, it was not uncommon for hunters going into the forest to fail to return. Their disappearance was charged to Gautil, a cannibalistic giant frequenting the vicinity. While no one actually ever saw him, they did see his tracks, and at times he was even known to have come directly into the village and carried people away. These events became more and more frequent until some plan had to be evolved to safeguard those remaining. A meeting of all the village was called, and a plan to get rid of Gautil was decided upon. Groups first went into the forest and dug a wide and deep pitfall. In the bottom were placed sharp pointed stakes, and when this was completed, the pit was covered with poles, boughs, and leaves to conceal its existence. While this was being done, others fashioned nets made of heavy cedar bark rope. Finally, the great day arrived. Two hunters went out into the forest and were tracked by Gautil. They led him to the pit where he fell in. The rest of the community threw nets over him and built a fire to roast him. But just as he was about to die, he spoke out saying, even though you kill me, I'll continue to bite you. And so saying, he died and his ashes turned into mosquitoes, which have bitten the people ever since. Now, Nora and Richard Downhauer wrote that the Gutil story or Gunil story does not appear to be owned in contemporary Clinket oral tradition. And most versions connect the story somehow with the interior or migration. I know that Robert Zuboff had a famous um, uh, story of this, famous telling of this story. However, they note that the story is often related to the frog house of the Jilkat Ganachadi, who owned the cannibal spirit totem Gutnil. Um, it's interesting to note, too, that um, um, Sorry, I'm mixing up with Frank St. Clair. Charlie Tagcook had also referenced a story on the totem pole that's down in Stockton, California, if some of you have been following that. He carved the, a similar pole in the earlier 1930s. It was bought by a man who put it in front of his gas station in Stockton, California, and it's still down there in a, in a firehouse. So apparently this, this was a very important story to him as someone from Klukwan, the Klukwan area and from a Raven Whitey clan. In June of, in July of 1940, this pole was shipped to Saxman, Alaska to be finished by William Brown. There were some complaints about the work of Charlie Tagcook by the Forest Service, and so I don't fully understand the whole story there, but it was actually shipped down to Saxman and William Brown finished it. And um, I couldn't find any images of Charlie Tagcook, unfortunately, Maxine Reichert believes there's a photo down in the Wrangell archive somewhere that I'm going to try to follow up on. But I do have an image here on the left of William Brown, who finished the governor's mansion pole. And he's standing here with his son, Charles Brown, in Saxman. William Brown was born in the 1860s in um, Tongas Village. He was Tequaidi. 
Tanta Kwan Te Kwe Di. And he had, um, just before the governor's mansion pool come down to, came down to Saxman, he had finished the work on a replica of the chief of all women pole, commonly known as the Seattle pole. And I don't know if you can see this here, um, it's kind of a, f a fuzzy slide, but the finishing ads work on the Seattle pole was all credited to William Brown. And if you even today go down to Seattle and look at that pole, it is just really fine, beautiful ads work that, um, so William Brown must have had some training. No one really remembers where he had his training, but he did grow up in Tongas Village and um, owned several poles that he actually allowed the Forest Service to bring up to the Totem Park in Saxman. I was also really interested in the um, painted work on the final governor's mansion pole because it's very similar to all of the U forms that both William Brown and Charles Brown often put on the cheeks of their figures. And this doesn't seem to be very common in many Northern poles. It's a very Southern tradition. But you can see um, the image on the right, this is from man in the brown bear hat that's now in totem bite. This was carved by William Brown's son, Charles Brown. And if you look very closely at those U forms, Charles Brown, he carved them in such fine relief. They're literally just a, a centimeter hovering above the surface. And then he painted them with this very beautiful, these kind of tapering lines. In any case, I'm really tracking those U forms on these cheeks because here's more Charles Brown work, with all the U forms. But if you look on this very old photo, one of the earliest photos we have from Fort Tongas by Edward Moybridge of the, um, crest pole that's on the far right, you can see again those U-forms on the cheeks. And it seems to be this very, uh, this continuing motif in a lot of Southern painting. So the second pole, and again, this is where I get really sad because I had some really nice images and they didn't show up for some reason. But the second CCC poll that ended up in Juneau um, is by John Wallace, who was probably one of the most famous of the CCC carvers. He was one of few who had extensive training in the 19th century. He had trained under his father to be a professional um, totem pole carver. What's really interesting to me about this poll is that there's no evidence it was ever intended for Juneau. It seems that Edward Keaton, who was um, the curator over at the here at the Alaska State Museum, um, worked with the Rotary Club to bring it up to Juneau in the 1960s. So it was a good 20 years after the CCC period when it came up here. Um, this is a 35-foot pole made of red cedar from southern southeast Alaska, and it shows the incredible knowledge. He squeezed four different crest stories into this 35-foot pole. And if you know the history of John Wallace working under the Forest Service for the CCC, he often had a lot of friction around the government's ideas of he had to do these exact replicas of the 19th century poles, and the Forest Service really held him to these exact replicas of crest stories that he knew very well. So I see this pole as this kind of excitement where he could design any crest stories he wanted, and he packed four of them onto a pole. It was the first time that the Forest Service had allowed him to kind of showcase his own knowledge of crest stories rather than replicating 19th century ones. Wallace was one of the few carvers, as I said, in the CCC program who had received extensive um, totem pole carving training in the 19th century. He was born on Prince of Wales Island in the late 1850s or early 1860s to a long line of Kaigani Haida carvers. His father, Kid Kwajus, or Dwight Wallace, was Yagulanus Raven from Klinkwan, who was recognized as one of the most important Kaigani Haida carvers of the 19th century. Dwight Wallace's father had also been a noted carver, and art historian Robin Wright, <coughs> excuse me, has suggested that John Wallace may have received his paternal grandfather's name, Guayudal, in recognition of his early interest in carving. 
Wallace told of this interest in a four-page autobiography that his daughter typed from his dictation in 1931 where Wallace recounted how he tried twice to leave his home village of Klinkwan in order to attend boarding schools in Masset and Sitka. Quote, when I came back from Wrangell, where he had tried to convince a preacher to take him to the boarding school in Sitka, I ran away again to Masset. <clears throat> I wanted to have an education as I knew education was a good thing to have. After I went to school for a year at Masset, my father came after me and took me away. His idea was for me to become an artist. He used to tell me that later in my life I would make money from carving totem poles. He didn't want them to lose the art of carving among the Haidas. When he took me away the second time from school, I gave up hopes in trying to get an education and took my father's order in carving totem poles." Unquote. So Wallace began training with his father in the 1870s in Klinkwan, and in just a moment, I'll show you one of the poles that was carved for the 1876 World's Fair in Philadelphia, Steve Brown believes was carved by Dwight Wallace and assisted by John Wallace, a very young John Wallace as an apprentice. And we'll see some of those motifs even on this Juno, this Juno pole. So this pole is always labeled as being completed in 1940, but I am, um, a little dubious about that. I believe that it was completed in 1942. And the reason for that is because there's this letter in the Forest Service archives from CM Archbold, who was the US Forest Service um, district ranger based down in Ketchikan, and he oversaw all of the totem park work that was going down in southern southeast Alaska, including in Heidelberg. He worked very closely with John Wallace. And at the end of the CCC program, you can see this is after December 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor had been bombed, the US has entered World War II now, and in June of 1942, Congress cut off all funding for the CCC. They were gonna redirect it to the war effort. So the Forest Service was kind of scrambling to figure out what to do with the totem poles that were still left um, and this was a letter from C.M. Archbold where he says, Heidelberg's Park is practically completed, but we have one finished totem pole in the shop, which was finished by John Wallace after the other natives quit this spring, and which must be moved to clear out the shop before returning to the town council. At first I thought that this letter might reference another Wallace pole that now stands down in Seattle. It's the Spirit of North Island pole. But that poll was clearly documented as having been completed in 1937 um, for the waterfall cannery on Prince of Wales Island. So it could not have been the poll that was still in the Heidelberg shop in 1942. This four-story poll also apparently stood at Waterfall Cannery for a time before Edward Keaton, who was curator at the Alaska State Museum, paid to have it shipped to Juneau in, the in 1962 with the help of the Juneau Rotary Club. So it doesn't look like this pole was actually intended for Juno. Um, and it's also a bit strange that the Rotary Club bought the pole since CCC poles were not supposed to be sold. So there's some more um, research to be done there. But in any case, the move from Prince of Wales up to Juno may have yielded an unexpected benefit. Just yesterday, Jim Samar mentioned to me that um, Nathan Jackson really credits the excellent condition of this 1940s pole to the fact that it was dragged in salt water from Prince of Wales all the way up to Juneau. So it got a very good soak before it, before it came. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay, I know we're almost, I'm just going to, I had some beautiful images of these. The um, four-story poles um, have some motifs that are common to other poles that Dwight Wallace carved. If you can see that, um, I don't have, can you, does my cursor work here? Can you see this kind of triangular prow? This was a very common story with land otters that both Dwight Wallace and John Wallace frequently depicted on these poles. So there's a lot of recurring motifs in their work. And again, these are some of the images that disappeared. 
But since we're out of time, I'm going to um, move on to the Yachte poll. And I had prepared um, some research on this poll, but I would really like to hand this over to um, Ed Kuntz in just a moment. I'll just tell you um, this poll, oops. And I'm sorry, I don't know what happened to the images. They got all mixed up this morning. I hope most of you are familiar with this poll out at Ock Bay. I did have a nice image of it. Um, but the design for this poll was credited to Lynn Forrest, the Forest Service architect, and then Frank Sinclair, who was from Huna, was asked to carve it along with two unnamed carvers, as I mentioned before. When I was preparing this paper, I had a long phone conversation with um, Frank St. Clair's great nephew, Fred Fulmer, who assisted Wayne Price on the most recent restorations of this poll in 2015. And he said that his um, grandfather was Deshi Tan from Huna, um, but that Lynn Forrest was the one who had designed the poll based on stories working with the Aquan people. And but I'll just note one last thing. I know that Lynn Forrest named his own boat Yachte. He lived out at Ak Bay and seems to have been very interested in this history of um, the Big Dipper crest for the Yachte people. But at this point, I'll hand it over to Ed Koontz. Will you, would you be willing to come speak, Ed? He knows much more about this. Yes, I had Dr. Huddy, I had Satan Ye Achter Asa. Took it a hit, Achkohidi. Tidari, the Tred, I had Kagwantar Yedi Chukhatsiti. I'm Raven, I'm Koho, Satan. Is my ceremonial name. I'm from the Outwards House. The Standing House is over in Sitka. The original house was up in Yakutat. Uh, George Romas translated the name Digginahit as the far out in the ocean house. But my mother always called it the house in front. I'm a grandchild of the dog salmon and a child of the Cogwan Tarn. And my my father's house was right next to his father's house, my grandfather. And my house is where my grandfather's house stood. I remember uh, when the workers were being picked up to go out to where they were working, uh, the truck would stop uh, on Willoughby Avenue right right in front of what was, what was called the Cropley House. This book is called Raven's, Raven's Journey, and it's written by uh, two ladies, Kaplan and Marzadez. And uh, there is a picture of the hat, just as a Raven barbecued hat. And this 
hat recalls the story of the raven and uh, the little birds on the shaft of the pole that was erected out at Ock Bay. Over in Sitka, 1904, um, there was a party that was called the last great party. The Cohos were guests at that party. And in this book, er, there was a series of pictures taken over in Sitka. And one of the pictures, it shows the Coho clan leader wearing this hat. And also in, in all those pictures, there's a a man standing with him in all those pictures whose name was Dekwa de U, uh, James Willard. He was a coho chief from Kukwan. These hats here, the uh, there's another gentleman in here wearing a hat called the Raven on the Roof hat. Those two hats are here in Juno now. Uh, the raven on the roof hat was up, was here uh, several years ago, and it went back to the museum. And our our clan leader said that when next time it comes up, it's going to stay here. Well, it's here now. And uh, at my brother's party, I use that to dance. At this, also at this last. Uh, Celebration. I was dancing with the uh, Southeast Native, uh, Native veterans. And, uh, two times on the stage, I used both of those hats. The Raven Barbecue hat, it looks very fragile. So I just carried it. <clears throat> and uh, in the early 70s, uh, Carol Berry Davis came to my mother and asked her if she could get together a group of uh, singers and dancers to travel with her down to Baltimore. She was head of the uh, entertainment for the Third World Congress of Poets. And she thought, uh, what better entertainment than singers and dancers from Alaska? There were other groups too that were part of the entertainment. <clears throat> there were no uh, The A and B, whenever they were going to raise money, they got uh, at a meeting, they called people together, and whoever wanted to dance would, would come with the regalia. But there, there was also a, a family group. At that time, there were the Marks Trail dancers. So that, those were the only two groups in town at the time. Well, we traveled with uh, Ed Boutiever, who was our travel coordinator, and uh, we had to change planes a few times. And uh, while we were at the airport waiting to board another plane, one of our elders from uh, the Mount Fairweather dancers over in Huna, one of the elders uh, who was Coho would bring, turn on her tape recorder and just listen to the songs, and some of the men would 
gather over there by her and start dancing. And pretty soon a crowd would uh, gather around us at the airport. So whenever I give the history of our dance group, I, I tell them we, are, we dance that way across the nation. We told the story of the Raven barbecuing. Also, the story is known as uh, the Raven and the King Salmon. There's a there's a short version of the the story in this book underneath the picture. I I will read it to you. When the Raven killed the King Salmon, a large crowd of small birds and squirrels rushed to the scene. Raven saw that the one salmon was not sufficient for the crowd. He thought of a scheme. He made the crowd dig a hole in the ground large enough to put the salmon in. After this was done, he, he sent them out, out after uh, some skunk cabbage leaves to wrap around the salmon for the barbecue. They packed in a pile of, of these leaves and the raven said that to, they packed in a pile of this the raven said uh, uh, leaves to wrap around the salmon for the barbecue. The raven asked where they got the leaves and they pointed to an area and the raven said that where they picked was unclean. And he instructed them to go beyond two mountains for the kind he wanted. In the meantime, when the birds left, in the meantime, the raven cooked the salmon and ate it <laughs> before, the, before the birds returned. And, <coughs> excuse me. When he got through with the fish, he wrapped the bones back up in the leaves and moved the fire back onto the pit there where, where the raven was cooking and he sat there to wait for the return of the birds like a, vir like a virtuous person <laughs> pretending to look like he was waiting for the fish to be cooked. And when they returned, he said, it must be dead now, so we'll open it up. And when they did, they had wrapped it, and there was nothing but bones. And there, he said that, uh, you were gone so long that the, all the fish must have cooked away. And all the little animals there that were gathered around, uh, were feeling bad because uh, they missed out on the feast that they were they worked for. When we put on display in uh, Baltimore, uh, Walter Silverleaf, who traveled with us, was the storyteller. And my dad, uh, even though he was a cogmontard and eagle, he played the raven. Uh, <clears throat> Al McKinley was a king salmon. And the four birds, when, when they were feeling so bad about missing the meal, they started crying. 
at the uh, uh, Raymond to make him feel better. He changed he, he changed the address to J. He gave a colorful top knot. And the magpie, who up until that time had a stubby tail, and he gave the magpie some bright colors and long feathers for his tail. The robin, who was standing too close to the fire, that his breast turned red, he allowed the robin to keep that bright color. The red he told you are so small people will hardly see you but you are a good whistler whatever anybody hears your whistles you will bring them good fortune During the celebration after we got back, uh, we used some of our same actors that belonged to my mother's group, and we told a story on stage. When we traveled to Baltimore, we traveled under the name uh, Southeast Dancers, and when we came back, we, my mother changed the name of her group, uh, Judo Clinket Dancers. This was before celebration started. So we already had a group together for the celebration. We were in the first, first uh, celebration. And at that time, I think there were about 300 singers and dancers at that celebration. And I thought I would never see that many singers, da singers and dancers at one time in one place. But now, at the celebration, there are over 1,500 from from all the different groups that come to celebrate their culture. Yeah, Thank you. So it sounds like we should call this the Raven Barbecue Pole, not the Yachte Pole, is that correct? And just so you're, it's clear those were the four, there are four little birds portrayed on the, and there's raven at the very top, and the yachte is at the bottom, so. I, I forgot to mention, uh, my dad only mentioned one of the carvers there, and it was a young man named Eugene Keen. Eugene Keen? Yes, he was, he had his uh, son there, My dad was talking to my brother and he said, I, I don't know why they didn't put the raven's beak on when it was laying down after they erected the pole. Some of the men were reluctant to volunteer, but he, Eugene King volunteered to go up there and put the beak on the raven. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much. And I would the last thing that I would add is um, this was a big deal for the Forest Service in the 1940s, Lynn Forest, to support an Aquan crest. There was very little um, references to the Aquan at Aqu Bay at that time. And so it's interesting to me that Lynn Forest was interested in, in having the government pay for a poll to be in that area. Thank you so much for staying late. <laughs>